I thought it would be wise tonight to kind of look back on a really key story in the election. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Pleasure having you aboard on this Friday night. Of course, it's Veterans Day, and uh, we can't even begin the program without, once again, it's never cliche, thanking our veterans and all those who have uh, supported the service of our country. Uh, you're never forgotten, and we should never, ever think it's cliche to thank you. So, thank you. Uh, we forego the rundowns on Friday night because we record our, th our Friday night program on Thursday afternoon. And it's time to be able to sit back a little bit and, and think about, you know, bigger picture topics and discussions. And I think this is a complicated one. So I would like to be in, bring on a guy who's been right in the middle of it um, for some real expertise. Former U.S. Attorney Robert Carrenti is my guest tonight. I want to talk about uh, what really was, for many, the October surprise. And a lot of people blame it on Hillary Clinton's loss. I'm not sure if that's true. We'll see what the U.S. Attorney says about that. But uh, before I... I start this, I just want to have a kumbaya moment and remind you that Donald Trump and the president did get together yesterday. It is important for all of us, regardless of party uh, and regardless of political preferences, uh, to now come together, work together, to deal with uh, the many challenges that we face. Uh, we want to do everything we can to help you succeed, because if you succeed, then the country succeeds. Please. Well, thank you very much, President Obama. Um, this was a meeting that was going to last for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, we were just going to get to know each other. We had never met each other. Uh, I have great respect. Uh, the meeting lasted for almost an hour and a half, and it could have, as far as I'm concerned, it could, could have gone on for a lot longer. We really um, — we discussed a lot of different situations, some wonderful and some difficulties. All right. Good start, seems to me. But, you know, a day or two later, a lot of this Washington Post headline, Comey is the reason. And uh, this is the letter that was sent on October 28th. You don't have to read it unless you've got a 72-inch screen there. But that's the letter sent to the chair people of the committees, various, kind of an update on the investigation that had quieted down and uh, we thought was somewhat cleared when it came to the email server for Hillary Clinton. Again, the former U.S. Attorney Robert Corrente, who's done some consultation for Eyewitness News, of course, in various cases, is my guest. My friend, good to see you. Thank you. Hi, um, short question, short answer. Did Comey put the final nail in her coffin? I don't see it that way. Uh, I think that uh, Director Comey was in a, a difficult spot. He had obviously come out on, I think it was July 5th, and had uh, announced the essentially the result of the initial review of, of her server. And then in the process of reviewing the additional devices that had come to light in connection with the Anthony Weiner investigation, apparently just stumbled upon uh, a very large cache of uh, additional materials. So <clears throat> at that point, he's, he, he's kind of in a tough spot. He's now 10 days out from the election. He's already made a public statement, or the, the FBI has already made a public statement about the closure of the initial investigation. And now he has a very substantial body of material that needs to be gone through, and he hasn't uh, a clue at this point whether he's going to find material in there that's important or he's not. So what do you do? If you say nothing, and then it turns out that there is important material in there, you're going to be accused by one side or another of having hidden the ball at a very important time. Uh, and he chose to take the other tack, which is to say, we've now found more material that was not turned over to us initially. It's our obligation to review that material. And they did so, I believe, uh, very expeditiously, working in shifts around the clock. And we're able to make an announcement before the election went off to say, we've now reviewed it, and there's nothing about the material in this second batch, which changes our initial July 5th uh, conclusion. I think he handled it appropriately. Yeah, well stated. It's, what's interesting is that it doesn't take a, and this is meant respectfully, it doesn't take a high level of law enforcement sophistication to make that analysis once you know the facts, because there was 
what you would call a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario there exactly. for him, correct? Exactly. Yet, let's go backwards to the original presentation that he made, which was, I don't know if it was unprecedented, but it certainly was irregular. Uh, the late summer presentation and then the ensuing interrogation by Congress. Um, you tell me, do you think that that was the appropriate and right thing to do? Because that can of worms really is what had put him in a place where once he had sig signaled to Congress that he was done and was asked, well, if new information comes, will you let us know? not doing, and I think you're correct, he had to because he did say he would, but putting himself in that arena was, was provocative. Well, it was, it was irregular in the sense that prosecutorial decisions are typically made by the Department of Justice as opposed to the FBI, and I know that the FBI is, is under the DOJ umbrella, but it really sort of runs itself as a separate organization. Um, what was a little bit unusual about the initial announcement was that the FBI was making the announcement that we've completed our review of the materials and we don't think there's enough here to prosecute. That's ordinarily an announcement which would be made by the Attorney General or somebody at her uh, behest. What we don't know, because it has not been revealed publicly, uh, at least to my knowledge, is whether the reason that uh, Attorney General uh, Loretta Lynch did not make that announcement herself was because of the situation she had been involved in with Bill Clinton having visited her on the tarmac. We don't know whether that was the reason or not. But well, that's, that's I, I one still don't understand why she didn't t why she took that meeting. That, Regardless that, of his cluelessness or motive, either he was wandering aimlessly looking for a social moment or motive to influence, why is she not keeping her powder dry? It's a question hardly anybody can answer. I don't think anybody can answer that, and I, uh, I have to think that, you know, given the, the reputation that she has, which is, which is quite good within the law enforcement community, that that may be one that she'd like to have over. Mm. I think the law enforcement community, which talks just like any other industry, probably has been doing a lot of water cooler what the, mm, over that one, right? Probably. Uh, okay. So... The, the, what's, what's really interesting about all of this is the nature of the FBI and the nature of, of the, uh, the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's system. So everybody understands, as local police and state police are to our Attorney General, they, they're, they're, out the, they're the crime busters and they're the investigators for the most part, they, re, you know, they come to the Attorney General's office. You know, in bigger states they have local prosecutors, but we have one prosecutor on the state level. Mm -hmm. um, that's how that works. The FBI does its police work, so to speak. Of course, it's a very broad branch. I mean, it's not just police work. It's civil work. It's, it's intel work. There's all sorts of things that we rely on the FBI for. This notion that the FBI operates somewhat autonomously from the Department of Justice in something that is quasi-political, I think a lot of people have trouble digesting that. Well, you know, the FBI, by its nature, is not a very, or is not intended to be a very political organization. The uh, well, we, we actually want it not to be, we? want it we? not to be, exactly, and it's staff. But this is a political story. It's a political story, and that's, that's kind of the interesting interplay here. The FBI is staffed by career law enforcement investigative types. The director is appointed for a, a, a term of years, and, and typically you don't see people getting appointed to the, the directorship who are very political by their own nature. If you look back... Yet everybody knows that Comey was a Republican and he doesn't shy away from that. Comey, Comey was a Republican, doesn't shy away from that, but then again, he, he was appointed director of the FBI by President Obama. Right. Because uh, Comey had kind of made his, his bones, of, even though he was a Republican, he had a, an independent streak and he had, he had you know, stood up to uh, some things going on in the department that he didn't agree with. And so I, I think that, that Director Comey is somebody who, who historically, at least in, in my experience, is very, very highly regarded by people on both sides of the aisle. I mean, he's a, he's, I, I worked for him. Uh, he was the, the Deputy Attorney General when I was in office. And he's, he's somebody who commands enormous respect from, from everybody in that industry. All right, so if that is the case, when we come back, we'll talk about whether that stays, uh, whether he stays, 
political, you know, political influence now going forward, promises a prosecution by a candidate, blah, blah, blah. Stay with us. Donald Trump, of course, our president-elect. Um, I apologize for not having it handy, but uh, I'm sure you've seen so many times Donald Trump talking about the notion that uh, she should be in jail, debates, rallies, you know, uh, lock her up was the chant by rally goers. As a law enforcement uh, professional, former, did that give you some agita? No. Why? I think that what you're going to see here is that there is a big, big difference between something that you can say on the campaign trail and something that you can uh, sort of uh, bring to bear once you're in office. It's not up to the president to decide who gets charged with what crimes. Well, well you know, I, uh, Bob, I gotta tell you, I couldn't agree more, but if I had a nickel now for everybody that's telling me uh, that uh, my literal analysis of things that people say during a campaign are something that people actually ought to value and think about and vote upon. But, you know, it's all the, the famous quote I, I, I hear from yesterday's show, you know, Zelino Zito uh, uh, in the Atlantic, you know, writes that the press took uh, Donald Trump literally but not seriously and his supporters take him seriously but not literally. Oh, okay. You know, I'm, everything now, everything now that is said in a campaign environment is to be taken not only with a grain of salt, but a whole dump truck of salt because right. none of it matters. I, I, come on, man. No, I, I, I don't say that it doesn't matter because I, I think that the, the comments that oh, By you, the way, the come on, man, it's not for you. It's for the concept, right. you know? I think the comments that you hear from the candidates are sort of a, a window into their thinking. They're indicative of how they approach the issues. But I wish he could be in jail. I wish he could be in jail. F fine. And maybe it was better to, to have phrased it that way. but. You know, there are a lot of things that he said, and frankly, a lot of things that she said on the trail that right. that are not going to be within their their purview. Understood. But there, you know, how many times did I say during the campaign here and on the radio? Uh, by the way, Mr. President, you don't make those decisions, and the idea that you would even campaign on the notion that you could shows a naivete about the Constitution. Uh, an underestimation about the seriousness of the job, blah, blah, blah. But what blah. we don't know, is, is he saying that because he means that or is he saying that as sort of a code phrase to appeal to the people that don't like Hillary Clinton? Is he, is he sort of stirring it up, stirring the pot well, and I saying, I, I, lock her up, put her in jail, and people are cheering. Regardless yelling. of what the answer is, there's an overall, an overarching responsibility, I think, that is what has a lot of people feeling very skittish this week about his is the, the eventual outcome of the election. Mm -hmm. um, six months from now, maybe we won't feel so bad because he's had three months in office and he's actually comporting himself like somebody is presidential and we forget about how we got there. Uh, but on that, repeat for everybody the process. The, the DOJ and the, and, and the FBI, uh, they are, for all intents and purposes, the exclusive determining factor as to whether somebody's prosecuted on a federal level. Yes? Yes. Yes, that, those decisions are made by the Department of Justice. The president so, can't make a phone call. Okay, by the way, yeah, look at this guy. Right, can't can't happen. The Department of Justice is entrusted with the obligation and the responsibility to take the investigative materials that have been provided to them, whether it's from the FBI or Secret Service or DEA, whichever organization might be involved, to look at those materials, to compare them against the legal standards for you know potential criminal charges and to make a prosecutorial decision. They're entrusted with that discretion. Do we have enough here to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes or no. It's not up to a court. It's certainly not up to the president or the governor or senators or anybody else. There's a, there, there's a wall there around what the DOJ has a responsibility to do. And the, the rest of what we hear on the campaign trail is, is talk. So the FBI feels damaged. Is it? I don't think so. As you said before, the FBI does a lot of things, and they do most of them very, very well. And you know, there, there's always a tension. There's always going to be a tension between law enforcement investigators who like to see their work come to fruition, like to see their cases or their investigations turn into cases, turn into convictions. And there's a responsibility on behalf of the prosecutors to 
sort of look at that in the, you know, the cold light of morning, to look at that investigative material and say, is there enough here to present this to a court to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt? So all doubt? this source work that the FBI is, uh, you know, at least uh, a, a momentarily broken organization, rife with controversy, disagreement over Comey, uh, Rudy Giuliani, you know, talking about how former Justice Department and FBI folks, you know, were were more or less, you know, suggesting that this thing wasn't over, and then the letter that came in on Sunday. You know, the, the Sunday letter was really late, right? So we had the October 28th letter that says, yeah, we, we, you know, we got a look-see, could be, could be not. Then Sunday night, it's, yeah, nothing there, way too late. I mean, there's, there's a lot of interpretation going on right now in terms of um, whether this place is off the rails. But you know what, I don't think it's off the rails. Think about what, what just happened on Oct October 27th to 28th, whenever that, that second letter came out. That was the point at which the, the top brass of the FBI had been made aware of, of what had turned up in the, in the course of the investigation. And they committed to doing their review as quickly as they, they could. They worked around the clock in shifts and I think pretty remarkably were able to announce two or three days before the election, we finished. We got through it all and it doesn't change our results. So by the time the election happened, they had explained to the people what they had, they had done the complete review and they had announced the results of that. All right, when, uh, when we come back, we'll talk about the difference between the server investigation, the WikiLeaks stuff, the FBI is actually looking into the Russian intervention. Then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what could come, and then the notion that the FBI locally doesn't tell us anything ever. Stay with us. <laughs> All right, the, the center of the conversation with the former U.S. Attorney Robert Corrente is the FBI. A couple of quick concepts. A lot of people are confused as the, to the server issue, Hillary Clinton's server issue uh, with the Secretary of State using her own private server, and then all the stuff from WikiLeaks and, and Russia. They're very separate conversations. Yes. Um, do you have an opinion on Hillary Clinton and whether she put the country in jeopardy? I haven't read the, uh, the same emails that the FBI was able to, uh, to review. I think w that Director Comey in his July letter was you know, took great pains to say even though we don't think this is a case that uh, should be prosecuted we don't really know we, you know the, yeah. we, we've seen enough to know that she was very very careless about the handling of this material and, and, and I'll tell you you know having having been there the, the the government takes the issue of security clearances very very seriously I mean, yeah. this is not stuff they, they and let's not forget that when I say the story was political it was about national security yes. well, let's not kid ourselves yes. and then of course we have a, what seems to be Russian intervention into um, the the DNC and in the Clinton campaign uh, weaving a tail through WikiLeaks that is a focus of the FBI's investigation correct there, there's that investigation there was the server investigation and then there's the whole third investigation into the Clinton Foundation and the, the, and the, the speaking fees, speaking fees, and, and, and whether and that was a pay for play. Right. Uh, all of that was percolating in this election, and, and while I'm not, you know, I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, so I have no, I really don't have a, a horse in this game. But I think the Comey 28th letter reminded everybody that she's got problems, mm -hmm. and may have had an impact on this race. We could argue about that until the cows come home, and I think but, people but will, historically will try to evaluate that in in its real space, I don't know. You know, in, in evaluating how important that was in the outcome of the election, I'm not so sure that the end result of any of those investigations is what's important here. I think it's the fact that all this stuff was going on and all this required the intervention of the FBI and required these kinds of investigations to go on. I think an awful lot of people were just so troubled by what they heard about the private server, about the foundation, about the you know what was going on with with the Russians, that gave enough people cause to maybe affect how some of them voted, regardless of how they came out. Understood. Um, the FBI doesn't tell us anything locally. That's I mean, their job. Every once in a while, the U.S. Attorney's Office may suggest that they've got an interest in something, but for the most part. You probably could have got rich on the number of times you were told, oh, I cannot confirm or deny, but I have bleh, 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 bleh. So the nature, at least on a regional and local basis, is that um, once you guys are in the role, 
you look at me with that same look you're looking giving me now, which is, sorry, Hotshot. Uh, Can't tell you. You'll know when you know. Right. And on our time, thank you very much. You guys work at your own, respectfully, damn pace, don't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he says as former, yeah. but playing the role of current. Um, is that healthy? There's no alternative. I mean, you cannot responsibly run a criminal investigation and make prosecutorial decisions and prosecute those cases that you've charged. You can't do that responsibly if you are simultaneously sharing information about what's going on in the investigations with the general public. Or setting artificial timelines? Yes can't be done. Tell me about the politics in that, in that, in that in, you know, U.S. attorneys are, are, are uh, political appointees. Yes. Peter Nerona uh, is highly respected. He is. And very well um, uh, admired in the job that he's doing. Yes. Does he survive, does he survive a Trump candidacy? Uh, too early to I mean, tell. I mean, a presidential? Too early to tell, but I, I, I will tell you that historically, when the White House changes hands from party to party, the, the tradition is that the existing U.S. attorneys uh, over the course of several months uh, are either asked to or voluntarily submit their resignations with the understanding that it's, it's for the new administration to appoint those U.S. attorneys that it, it wants to have in office. I wonder, I wonder if Donald Trump brings the depth to be able to act quickly on that level. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, more or less campaigning publicly for the U.S. attorney job. Uh, I had a lot of respect for Rudy Giuliani. The last three months of this campaign have been a wild ride with him. Thought on him becoming the top law enforcement officer in the country? I think it's, it's, it's too early to, to say. I mean, obviously, he, he was very highly respected for the job that he did in New York, especially right after 9-11. I think he well, is. Well, as a prosecutor, he's well respected. Never mind his elected as position. As a prosecutor, he's very well respected. He, he was very highly uh, placed in the Justice Department. Can he turn the, the political Reagan. switch off and, and provide credible leadership in that office? I don't know. That, that's going to be the issue because, as you point out, in the last year or so, or certainly the last three months, he's become much more of a political actor than. Can Chris Christie before. do it with Bridgegate hanging over his head? Don't oh, know. Chris Christie was in office when I was in office. I, I worked with him. He's a he was a very good prosecutor too. But you know he's he's now in a more political role as well. But you tell me, and I want everyone to know that you feel this way. Uh, Director Comey is a guy that you have you have tremendous respect for. No, still, no question. Impeccable integrity. No question. Damaged as an, as a professional after all this. I don't think so, because for the people that know him and the people that know the kind of job that that he's done. I don't think anything about what has gone on in the last three months uh, tarnishes him. Does he stay with Donald Trump? I don't know. I don't know. He's, he, he's, he's been put in a very pressurized situation. He's had to make some... Uh, it would be his call because he can be there if he wants to be. He, he can be there if he wants to be. It remains to be seen whether, given how all this has played out politically, whether he, he wants to stay on or whether he wants to go off and do something else with his life now. Would you hedge your bet? No. I can't get anything from this guy. <laughs> Except the great conversation we're having, Howard. Thank you, sir. Bob Corrente, be right back with a final word. No doubt, a uh, historical week. I don't think, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, that you can deny that. There are a lot of people who feel like their gut's been kicked in. There are a lot of people who think that they just died and went to heaven, uh, which is really reflective of the polarization prior to the election, no doubt. We'll try to get both points of view in reaction to this Trump election next week here on Dan York State of Mind. Have a great weekend. Thank you again to our veterans for all your service. Good night.